Siskel and Ebert review Macaulay Culkin on the loose again in Home Alone 2, Lost in New York. Anthony Hopkins learns a lesson in humanity in The Efficiency Expert. And Detective Harvey Keitel is out of control in Bad Lieutenant. Macaulay Culkin, the most popular lost kid in movie history, goes astray once again in Home Alone 2, Lost in New York, one of the new movies we'll be reviewing this week on Siskel and Ebert, including the controversial new Bad Lieutenant. And we'll also have an interview with Denzel Washington, the star of Malcolm X. I'm Roger Ebert of the Chicago Sun-Times. And I'm Gene Siskel of the Chicago Tribune. Our first film is Home Alone 2, Lost in New York. And everyone I know who has seen this picture says pretty much the same thing, that it's essentially a carbon copy of the first film, and that was... My reaction too. Macaulay Culkin, who else again stars as Kevin, and the second time around, we can really appreciate his talent. He is impossibly cute, and he gives perfect little hesitant line readings as he realizes he and his family have jumped on separate planes for their Christmas vacation. Oh no, my family's in Florida and I'm in New York. My family's in Florida, I'm in New York. Little Kevin ends up checking into New York's Plaza Hotel, pretending he's waiting for his father. Naturally, he has a ball with the hotel staff, including Bellman Rob Schneider. Is everything all right, sir? Is the temperature in the room okay? It's okay. Do you know how the TV works? I'm 10 years old. TV's my life. Well. I'm sorry. And there's plenty more where that came from. Out on the streets, as in the first film, he meets a threatening stranger who turns out to be a nice person after all. In this case, a pigeon lady, played by Brenda Fricker, the Oscar winner, as the mother in My Left Foot. They have a nice scene together. Do you know that it's been a couple of years since I've talked to anybody? That's okay. You're really good at it. You're not boring. You don't mumble or spit when you talk. You should do it more often. I think you just have to wear an outfit that doesn't have pigeon poop on it. <laughs> then the burglars, played by Joe Pesci and Daniel Stern, show up like the coyote in the Roadrunner cartoons to take their licks from Kevin. I gave a marginal thumbs down to the original Home Alone. I really don't like those burglars. This time I appreciated yes. Macaulay Culkin more. He has a special gift. He is positively charming. But this time, too, I felt the burglar scenes were even more annoying. Again, marginal thumbs down for me on Home Alone 2. And I know that every 10-year-old kid in America is going to hate me for it. Well, I won't hate you for it, Gene, because my thumb is not even marginally down. And I'll tell you why. First of all, I didn't even go for the Brenda Fricker scenes because I thought that they went on way too long, were overwritten and treacly and sentimental and shameless in the way that little the little twerp kind of lectures her on the meaning of life and the meaning of truth. And she's so grateful to find out these words of wisdom from his angelic little mouth. And then as far as the burglars are concerned, the violence, which is obviously, you're quite right, modeled on all those cartoons with the Roadrunner yeah. and Wiley Coyote. And they use the wide angle lens to make right. it seem that things are really coming from a long way down and slamming on top of everyone is really tough stuff. You know, usually live action versions of cartoons don't work because when flesh and blood is involved, it's not that funny. I do think that this kid is a big talent. Oh, I, mean, I think Macaulay yeah. Culkin. I'm not now I'm not criticizing Macaulay Culkin, yeah, the actor. I'm criticizing the character, Kevin. Who, who a little bit of, if Kevin goes a long way, I mean, the, the entire scene in that townhouse when he's dropping 
50-pound bags That's of cement the on them and tricking them into sticking their heads into exploding toilets and so forth. I mean, this stuff, it may even sound funny when I describe it, but the fact it, is eventually it, wears it you gets out. real old and it, exhausting. It, it wore me out, too. Okay, next movie, and our next film is Stacey Cochran's My New Gun, a poker-faced comedy about strange private lives in the suburbs. The movie stars Diane Lane and Stephen Collins as a dreary married couple whose life takes on a little excitement when their best friends explain that every couple should own a handgun. First of all, she's got to go through Port Authority every night. She carries it with her? It's very small. It's got Myra etched in the handle. Do you want to see it? It's here. It's in my bag. Hold on. <laughs> Collins insists over his wife's objections that she get a gun, and he supervises her training sessions. What? It's because you are crouched. Try it again standing up. Come on. Meanwhile, Lane is friendly with their strange neighbor from across the street, played by James Legro. Don't turn off the water. I need to talk to you. What about? About what we talked about before. You mean? I mean the gun. What do you mean? I need to borrow it. She says no, but he takes it anyway, leading to a showdown with the angry husband. I thought you said you wanted it out of the house. Oh, excuse me, please. So I got it out of the house. You're just trying to help. The most dangerous thing you can do with a gun is panic about it, and I thought it'd be safer. Since when are you so concerned about the safety of me and my wife? Well, we're neighbors, Gerald. I was never quite sure what my new gun was really about, but that was sort of okay. <laughs> One of its targets may be the attitude that guns are as American as apple pie. It's interesting in this movie how important guns are to the men, how they seem to represent some deeper meaning than simply security or home protection, and that it's through the subject of the gun that all the men quarrel. You don't have to be Freud to figure that out, but the movie is also funny in the way it observes little everyday quirks of speech and of behavior. I thought it was too long, it ran out of steam before the end, but it has its moments. It's a close call, but I'd vote thumbs up. And I liked it too. I uh, like the Diane Lane character an awful lot. I mm -hmm. like the way that she's... Uh, sort of a servant and then uh, is empowered in some way by the, the gun mm -hmm. and by the neighbor. I thought the inclusion of that neighbor across the street and it's not explained what their relationship mm -hmm. really is uh, was really inventive and I enjoy that. Mm -hmm. there, there, there are fresh characters here. The portrait of this man with his uh, little townhouse on, I guess, I think it's on a golf club, or it seems like it Somewhere is, surrounding like that, yeah. like that uh, w was very well done. I, I, I enjoyed the picture a lot. And he's such a pompous buffoon. It's always mm -hmm. fun to see somebody like that uh, brought down a few pegs. One of the things about all of these films, and it's a little genre here of films, is that they back into the plot. So at the yes. beginning of the movie, the characters know everything about all of the relationships, and you don't know anything. And that's so you're refreshing. you're constantly saying, what is this guy doing standing here? Right. Why is he making these references? What is he talking about? In this movie, even Diane Lane doesn't know until halfway I, through. I, th then that part I enjoy. We see so many routine films, and yeah. this is fresh. Coming up next, Harvey Keitel stars as a corrupt, drug-addicted cop looking for salvation in the controversial drama, Bad Lieutenant. No one can kill me. I'm blessed. This what you want to slow down? The one you did. I want to get paid. What about tomorrow? What do you guys want to do? Want to make a bundle? Leave it all in the mess. That's Harvey Keitel as the title character in Abel Ferrara's Bad Lieutenant, a movie that's genuinely shocking in its depiction of the depravity of its central character, a drug-addicted, gambling-addicted, woman-abusing New York City detective who is on a one-man war to self-destruct. He cheats on his wife with prostitutes. My heart's at your command, dear. He shakes down teenage girls for disgusting sexual favors. You do something for me, and I'll do something for you. What do you say about that? You do something for me, and your father won't find out you took his car and you drive without a license. He keeps doubling his losing bets on baseball. Put in my bet! There's nothing to think about. Either you put in my bet or you get nothing. But a vicious crime that he must solve points the way out of his morass. A nun, played by Frankie Thorne, is raped and beaten, and yet she forgives her attacker. This stuns Keitel. It will take such an incredible act to pierce his veil of self-abuse. Deep down inside, don't you want them to pay for what they did to you? Bad Lieutenant then turns into a dual-edged thriller. Can he catch the nun's attackers? And what will he do with them and himself after he finds them? 
Look at that. You can't do a thing about that, can you? Can you? Look at me. Can you? Director Abel Ferrara has made films of questionable violence before, like Ms. 45, but the stuff of Bad Lieutenant is much more personal and depraved. If it were not for the risk-taking performance of Harvey Keitel, who literally lets it all hang out in this movie in an incredible fashion, much of Bad Lieutenant would come off as either a freak show or as a bad imitation of the most violent scenes in Martin Scorsese's Taxi Driver. But Keitel lets us see that a real man is committing these horrible acts, and we stare in wonder at how it will all end. I didn't particularly enjoy watching Bad and Lieutenant, but I will never forget its central performance. Thumbs up from me. Thumbs up for me, too. And once again, uh, the performance is the key to this yes. film. Although you cannot take it away from Abel Ferrara that he was able to conceive of this uh, uh, showcase for Keitel's acting talent because only a director like Ferrara, who has the willingness to take the NC-17 rating, which is death at the right. box office, and to risk it with, a direct, with, a, with, a, with an actor like Harvey Keitel, would have made this film. There aren't many other directors in the country who would have touched this material. And when people see movies like this, sometimes they, you know, we were, we're both going to give a thumbs up. People will go to see it. We'll get letters yes. saying, how could you possibly have recommended such a disgusting film? And the answer is because, in a sense, Anything that partakes of human life in a truthful way is going to help me in some way or another. Right. And this, I feel it in my bones that this movie is showing us a side of reality that does exist and that is not usually seen in the film. Well, the parallel film to this would be um, Scorsese's the part of Taxi Driver, but actually much more Raging Bull, where yeah. the question is, can a, can a guy who thinks he's bad ever become good? Mm -hmm. This is not Raging Bull caliber material in my opinion i think it's more a sec a series of scenes rather than an organic mm -hmm. film in my opinion mm -hmm. uh, but the Keitel performance links it and so i was able to follow the material because i was watching i was watching him more than i was watching the individual actions which mm -hmm. are so shocking they stand out apart almost from him. it's great work and i'll tell you something gene about the nc-17 rating which we yeah. talked about before because that, uh, of I, that rating harvey Keitel doesn't have a chance of getting an Academy no, Award nomination, right. and you cannot tell me that there are five better performances this year in the movies than the one he gets. Well, I, I hope we see him. That would be a make for an exciting year. When we come back, Anthony Hopkins plays a man of great intelligence who can strike terror into the hearts of ordinary people. He's called the efficiency expert. I don't think you quite understand what I'm doing here. I'm not an interior designer. Regarding the general updating and modernization of ball moccasins. That's Anthony Hopkins there as an efficiency expert who's been brought in to save an Australian moccasin <laughs> factory from bankruptcy. He has his work cut out for him because the factory owner, that benevolent old man who was showing him around, has essentially run the factory for the entertainment of his employees. <laughs> now the party is over and it's up to Hopkins to restore financial sanity. Uh, these can't be the... Uh... Uh, the uh, co uh, complete financial records, Miss Bull, surely. As far as I know, they are. There's a young man on the staff who seems to have some promise, and Hopkins wants him as an assistant, but the kid has only one thing on his mind, the boss's daughter, who he is head over heels in love with. Oh, I can't type for anything like that. No, no, well, you wouldn't have to type. Mr. Ball's daughter will be working with us. Cheryl? Yes. Would I be working with Cheryl? Yes, with Cheryl and myself, just the three of us. You get a desk to yourself. Oh, no, no, I, I don't mind sharing with Cheryl. The efficiency expert is not only set in the 1960s, but feels like it was made then, too. It's one of those oddball, good-hearted, little working-class comedies like the British made 30 years ago. Movies like I'm All Right, Jack. And it has the same subtle way of seeming to be about one thing while really being about another thing. In this case, about human nature and the way in which the expert doesn't repair the factory so much as the factory heals the damaged soul of the expert. It's a gentle movie with a lot of small, observant laughs in it, and I liked it. Oh, I did too, and for the same reasons, it is a, it is a, a delight to see how the factory people work. And, and what I like about it is the pace at which this film, I think an American film might have had the switchover come a little earlier in the mm -hmm. story, and this, they just sort of grind him down with yeah. kindness and, <laughs> and, and envelop him and, and in a way that they don't even realize. Mm -hmm. It just sort of lets it take over, and you're, you're sitting here watching to see which way the yeah. story's going to go. And I, I, I enjoyed and they, it a lot. They humor him, you know, well, we're very 
very interested in your ideas, but in the meantime, why don't you come and look at our slot car racing, because that's really fun. That sequences, the slot car race in this movie <laughs> is definitely worth seeing. Coming up, the star of Malcolm X talks about his experiences making the most talked about movie of the year. An interview with Oscar winner Denzel Washington is next. These glasses were always slipping. To the lead of contenders for this year's Best Actor Oscar, if he were in fact to win, Washington would achieve something rare. He would become only the fourth actor in history, along with Jack Lemmon, Robert De Niro, and Jack Nicholson, nice company, to win Oscars in both the lead and supporting categories, having won previously for his supporting performance in the Civil War drama, Glory. Oh, I see. So the white man give you a couple of stripes, next thing you know, you holler and order and everybody around, like you to master himself. Making both Glory and Malcolm X has provided Denzel Washington with a real education about the history of black and white relations in this country. We talked about it earlier this month in New York. What surprised you about Malcolm X the more you studied him? How smart he was. And he, he would have probably said he wasn't smart, but how, how disciplined he was. I mean, this man, I was telling someone earlier, he, he wrote out the entire dictionary, you know, word for word. Is there something that you are going to change in your life by having played the role? In other words, are you going to be more disciplined? Have you said, I mean, are you going to no, be? We can throw that out the window. The discipline part. I, I, I learned to study history. To not take history for granted. I'm no longer in a in a denial about slavery, because I've studied it, you know, extensively, and I and I understand. I have a better understanding of, of of what my investment, what African Americans' investment in this country was, and how this country could not have become. Uh, one of the richest nations without using free labor. You're not an American. You're an African who happens to be an American. You have to understand the difference. We didn't come over on the, the Nita, the Pinta, and the, and, the, and the whatchamacallit. We didn't land on Plymouth Rock. Plymouth Rock landed on us. Landed right on top of us. You know, a lot of white people are going to be afraid of this movie, afraid of the effect it might have, and they probably won't have seen it. Did this, playing this character, make you like white people more or less or not it change your me, opinion it makes me understand that we all have to we all are in need of therapy a, a terrible terrible thing happened in this country for a long time and people tried to legislate it away and that was what went on in the 60s and it was very important and in the 50s but you can't legislate people into loving each other it's proof of that now and that's what, that's part of the reason Malcolm's so popular now but people have to deal with really deal with whites have to deal with blacks have to deal with what went on here and to say oh well i'm not like that well you're in denial because you were a part of it and if you weren't your father or your grandfather was and you're probably reaping some of the benefits of it you know it's a part of my life if i wasn't enslaved i know my father or great grandfather or someone was and and those things still have an effect on me because it was generation after generation We've talked about it before on this show that one of the reasons why some of the new black movies seem to be so exciting and at the forefront of mm -hmm. American movies right now is that they're about something, and I think listening to him there, you get the same feeling. You know, I was surprised in talking to him by how political he was, and he went on and on and on, not only about the politics of Malcolm X, but also about the politics of the present day, and I think that's a side of himself that he's kept kind of private, but it's certainly there, very interesting. Might inform some of his performances in the years to come. When we come back, our Laserdisc Pick of the Month, we'll take a look at a 1940 Saturday afternoon serial and the Steven Spielberg blockbuster it inspired. This is Pioneer Home. Pioneer Home Theater. You don't just watch it. Now it's time for our Laserdisc of the Month segment, and as Gene mentioned when we inaugurated this feature last month, we both like Laserdiscs, not only for the much superior sound and picture quality, but also because... There's a lot of film buff type stuff that's available on disc and not on tape. My choices this month are two discs of movies made some 40 years apart, but put them side by side and you'll be surprised at the similarities. Manhunt in the African Jungle, just released on disc by Republic, is a 15 chapter 1943 serial directed by Spencer Bennett, known as the king of the serials and starring Rod Cameron as a U.S. spy who finds himself involved in intrigue not in the jungle, but actually in the African desert near Casablanca. Your death will be avenged, my father. Now let's jump forward to another laser disc. This one, the recent letterbox widescreen edition of Steven Spielberg's Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. Once again, a sadistic executioner and a diabolical machine of death. Kate Capshaw is the victim. Manhunt 
in the African Jungle is not a great film, and the Indiana Jones movies are, but it's fun to watch the serial in this crisp laserdisc version with its Art Deco props and its exotic interiors, and with the star, Rod Cameron, who actually somewhat resembles the taciturn Harrison Ford. Both movies are our Laserdisc Picks of the Month, and now let's take another look at the movies we reviewed this week. Two thumbs down for Home Alone 2, Lost in New York. We both agree the violent burglar scenes were overdone. Two thumbs up for My New Gun, the offbeat comedy with Diane Lane sparkling as a newly armed suburban housewife. Two thumbs up for Bad Lieutenant with special admiration for the risk-taking performance of Harvey Keitel. And finally, two more thumbs up for the efficiency expert with Anthony Hopkins in a sweet little comedy about the difference between efficiency and humanity. I'll tell you, of all the pictures, the one that I'd like to stand up for is the efficiency expert. Because yeah. even as we were talking about it, I was recalling the slot car race. It is a charming film. Yes, See if it you is. can find it. Yes, it it's is. Good work. That's it for this week. Next week, we'll be back with a special edition of Siskel and Ebert devoted to the career of the multi-talented Steve Martin, who's starring in a new film called Leap of Faith. Steve Martin, that wild and not-so-crazy guy, is next week, and until then, the balcony is closed. Preferred stock, the extra smooth cologne for an extra special man. Preferred stock, what preferred men prefer. From the house of Stetson. Sundance puts family refreshment in a whole new light. Sparkling water, pure fruit juice, less than 10 calories per serving. Great tasting new Sundance light. It's America's favorite jelly bean. Jelly Belly, now appearing at theaters and video stores with good taste. Jelly Belly beans, try them, you'll love them. Kraft Touch of Butter Spread. It's made with rich, creamy butter. A touch of real butter makes a real difference.